Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Starting a new series um, this morning. I've called it um, Being Authentic. Being Authentic. Being Authentic. Uh, Authenticity is defined as the quality of being genuine or real quality of being genuine or real and uh, I came across this article Um, I'm subscribed to uh, the Men's Health which is an international it's not Christian by any means it's an international um, subscription service magazine it's been around for a number of years and it's written by a a guy called um, Jason Rogers and um, the title of it I'm going to just I've highlighted some things in here that I'm going to read to you. It's called He Men and the Holy Rollers. <laughs> he Men and the Holy Rollers. And um, this is the subtitle. Here it says Each fall, a Midwestern mega church hosts a primitive off the grid weekend for Jesus loving dudes. Here's what happened when one man, he's talking about himself, brought along questions about God, brotherhood, and life after death. And so this is coming from a journalist. He's a professional journalist, this is what he does for a living. He goes to a, uh, a camp, a man's camp, and um, he had a number of questions. And what I thought was quite rich out of here is just to try and gauge how the world perceives church, what, what the world thinks about the church. And um, this article was uh, revealed a lot of things. It revealed about the condition of Christianity today, especially in the Western Church. Uh, and it led me to ask a number of questions about pre- presenting the gospel to the lost with authenticity. And so uh, I just want to read, to some, uh, read you some things here. This is Hemen and the Holy Rollers. So it starts off, I was told that he would come. We were a few hours into man camp, an evangelical men's retreat in the Ohio River Valley. And this promise was a part of the level setting that uh, Tyler, our ball capped and rosy cheek group leader, thought he, we needed to hear. You shouldn't expect to shift all your perspectives in, in life in 48 hours, he said, with buoyant enthusiasm of a radio DJ. But you should definitely expect God to show up. And so I saw, Dodd, uh, I saw nods among the dozen and a half other faces lit by campfire. Our group consisted mostly of first-timers in their 20s and 30s from all over Ohio. Out in the darkness, there were nearly 2,700 other Jesus-loving dudes and 279 groups who had come as far as Mexico, Canada, and Ghana to camp in a 431-acre property. So this was a big deal. This was a big deal. Um, and so there was these line of guys that all lined up to attend a camp meeting. And so he continues, uh, uh, I'll just fast forward a little bit. It says, as a hearty flame crackled beneath the tar black sky, two men bonded over their wives' and miscarriages. Uh, another told us wistfully that his, his long estranged father had rebuffed his attempts to reconnect. And uh, he said, I revealed that I was going through the agonizing process of losing my dad to Towels, and uh, which is an incurable neurodegenerative condition that would soon rob him of his ability to speak and swallow. It was uncertainty of a slow erasure that weighed heavily most on me and my mum. We'd lose a fraction of, fraction of him every day until some f- uh, future unknown day that would lose him, would lose all of him altogether. Now the eldest member of my group, a 71 year old organic far- farmer named Herman, handed me his cross. And I have felt in my heart that I needed to give that to you for this weekend he said I sensed that he wanted me to put it on but instead I discreetly slipped it into my pocket officially I'd come to write about man camp as one of the latest examples in a tradition of evangelical men's retreats that combine macho activities with a sincere pursuit of God man camp which promises to destroy your spiritual comfort zone is a legal vices welcome weekend when I first encountered Tomei Tomei is the camp director the day before, uh, during setup, he greeted me with an easy gaze and a cause and a cigarette combo in his hand. So he was holding a can of beer and a, um, a cigarette and a cigar in his, 
in his hand as he met the uh, camp director. In addition to an intense fireside chat and the schedule featured a, ma uh, a manual labour activity, an arm wrestling competition and an obstacle course, there are spiritual talks and a prayer tent situated next to 50 kegs of free beer. <laughs> Sounds like a party. The weekend culminated with baptisms in an uninviting cow pond. Now my parents were lapsed Catholic, so I had adopted an agnostic lifestyle. But my dad's 2022 ALS uh, diagnosis uh, had kicked up all kinds of existential questions about life, death and his place in the much contested beyond. I'd also crossed into my 40s with a profound sense of being stuck. With no kids, I'd been trying to achieve my way out of feeling empty. Never a great strategy. Therapy was helping, but my gut told me I needed something bigger to overcome my soul-deep malaise. That's not to say I was fully prepared to accept Jesus into my heart. Now, all of that was running through my mind on Friday night when I, a cross landed in my hands by the campfire. I wanted to arrive to a greater sense of peace with everything happened in my world. But I wasn't quite sure what that looked like or if I was comfortable with what might or what it might take to get there. Just fast forwarding some stuff. And so they all came into, the, uh, into a, a big um, circus tent and then the house band Blood Brother played rock-infused worship music. Like, come like a flood, like a fire, Holy Spirit come. The front man wailed. The lyrics were projected onto the underside of the tent roof and men raised their hands and swayed like corn stalks singing loudly and many had tears in their eyes. This is the uh, world, worldly perspective for what goes on in church. <laughs> Suddenly Tomei appeared on stage wearing an orange anorak and a black cap. With Crosshair's logo or a Bud Guns shop and range, he quieted the music and asked if anyone was feeling open to Jesus in new ways. Men began to raise, rise from their seats one by one. When about 30 were standing, Tomei pumped his fist like a proud football coach and bellowed out, F year. So F U C K year. Into the mic. He quickly added it was his first time dropping the F bomb on stage in a godly context, but I didn't think so. The moment ended sweetly with the seated men standing, laying their hands on the shoulders of the attestors, forming little huddles. In his view, man camp was critical, considering the country's problem of male loneliness, a topic he returned to during his talk that morning, calling it the greatest epidemic, epidemic of our time. Before the trip, I'd read The Five Marks of a Man, Tomei's 2018 book on masculinity, and found it a bit generic. Men should have work, should have a vision, should be protectors, etc. But on stage, he was his character presence with a habit of delivering a serious point and then quickly releasing the tension with a comedic flick of the wrist. There in the audience, I thought of something Tomei had said to me over the phone before the event. Man camp is a failure if guys don't sense a connection with other guys and with God. Whenever the music kicked back up, men's arms shot in the air as if they were seeking an upward embrace. Their bond was first and foremost in submitting to something bigger than any one of them. Despite being a decade-long employee at Crossroads, this is it, he's talking to the worship leader here, he told me that he avoided the first four years of man camp. It's been operating for nine because of the hyper-masculine... One, two, three, let me go back on. Because of the hyper-masculine marketing. Dudes jumping dirt bikes, black and white imagery. In the early days, it was pseudo-militaristic vibe. I don't love the way it looks on the internet, Luke, he said but I can't deny that it gets people here wondering what they're about. There's a long history of evangelicals presenting a more muscular depiction of Christ in an effort typified by the 2001 book, Wild at Heart, which was sold more than four million copies for too long, author John Aldridge wrote, the church had often feminized visions of Jesus. Mr. Rogers with the beard. Aggression was innate in the man's soul and he needed to get it out in the nature uh, in nature to rediscover God and his warrior spirit. I'd already heard guys in the group cite Wild at Heart as an inspiration, and I knew that Eldred had exerted some influence on Tomei's work, or at least the Crossroads pastor seemed to be live, uh, living out the same vision online. It all felt a bit performative to me, but I recognised that his presentation as a guy's guy 
may be the precise reason that man camp is some of whom may worry that emotionally is a feminine trait trust them to take them to uncomfortable interior places now uh, Kristen Cobes Dumez the author of Jesus and John Wayne a book about the his history of evangelical masculinity says experiences like man camp can facilitate profound social and spiritual moment for guys but they can also leave those who aren't the bear guzzling boastling type feeling inadequate as they wonder is the one way to be a Christian man or the only way to be a Christian man there are a few instances that left me feeling uneasy and thinking about the tension raised by Kobe's Dumez for example Tommy made an on stage comment suggesting that being gay was sinful tempted by a same sex encounter yeah Jesus was too if Jesus could resist then apparently so could we he didn't linger on that point or launch into a homophobic theotrope as some evangelical pastors are, won't do, uh, want to do, but it was enough to invite some awkward questions, like who exactly was welcome at man camp and what kinds of masculinity did it endorse? Lukey, the blood brother musician, told me that he had a close friend who was non-binary, parted ways with Crossroads after feeling alienated. He left as well. He nearly left as well. I don't think the Bible neatly answers the questions that a lot of Christians think it answers. He said, referring to sexuality and gender, Lukey ultimately stayed because he believes Crossroad loves its people and at its core wants to help them follow Jesus in the best possible way. In a phone call after the trip, Tomei clarified that Crossroads is very welcome to the LGBT, well, the alphabet group, community, yet also called the church's position the radical middle and personally believes that although your sexuality doesn't send you to hell, marriage between a man and woman is the only sexual union celebrated by the Bible and it's all a bit of a brain twister. This is coming from a worldly perspective. Now there were miracles happening in the pre -tent. Apparently visions presented, energies released, and backs healed. When I arrived there late Saturday, large winged insects buzzing in the air, and the apparatus clouds undulating overhead like waves of foam. Inside I was led through a trios of men seated on hay bales and camping chairs to meet my prayer partners. Scott had a dark beard and corn-fed 40-ish handsomeness. Adon had a wide 30-something face and a scraggly goatee. And when I asked why I'd come to the tent, I explained that I was going on what was going on in my life. Professional frustrations, general anxiety, and above all, concerns about my dad. I was curious about all this Christian stuff, but I also felt a deep uh, resistance in equal measure. And then they said, there's not magic fairy dust that we sprinkle on, guys. Adon said, all you have to do is offer is Jesus in a relationship that he wants with you. We get a lot of folks who have Jesus knocking on their heart, but the door opens from the inside, Scott said. I couldn't help but think of the line by the uh, essayist John Jeremiah Sullivan, faith is a logical door which locks behind you. In other words, if you accept the terms of Christianity, your belief will then modify incoming information to reinforce itself. And I think this is rich. For another 10 minutes or so, I hesitantly expressed my doubts. Scott and Adon commented thoughtfully, but ultimately soft peddled me Jesus as one item, an all-you-can-eat buffet. The two men asked to pray for me, putting their hands on my shoulders and my back. Scott petitioned God uh, to make direct contact before asking my father's safe passage into heaven. Adon asked the same God to restore my dad to full health. I winced at the inconsistency. Then for several moments we stood in silence, the men's hands shaking as if zapped with electricity. <laughs> Afterward they looked at me expectantly. Had I felt anything? I told them ruefully that I had not been reached. No sense of the spirit through all of that? Scott asked incredulous. It was not the first time that the weekend that men had asked to pray for me, but suddenly I was aware of the dark chasm that those prayers revealed. No matter how kind, patient, and loving the tone, they bore an instructive undercurrent like a kindergarten teacher sweetly rephrases a command to make a child feel that compliance was their idea. Didn't I know that failing to accept Jesus resulted in consequences? Didn't I want to be saved? I told my group about my struggle in the prayer tent. While not spiritually significant, it had been emotionally helpful, I said, but I just couldn't swallow the pill. I fully respect you trying to figure something out in your own timeline, uh, time Tyler said. After a month, man camp, a month after man camp, my father lost his ability to eat 
and had a feeding tube installed. A couple of weeks later, he could no longer understand him and began communicating exclusively through writing or a text-to-speech app. One night, I visited him at home and told him about the trouble I was having finishing this article. A central thread was eluding me. Worse, I questioned my original intentions. I'd convinced myself I was open to the Christian experience, but I was doomed from the start. The world I came from, progressive politics, feminist wife, skeptical dad, was too a vast a moat to cross. I asked why I'd given up Catholicism. Ah, oh, sorry. I asked why he'd given up Catholicism, thinking we could find solidarity in a mutual doubt. It's too much punishment and purgatory, he wrote on his little handheld tablet. Then he shared that despite leaving his parents' faith, he had a one-way conversations each night with a Christian-esque God. And he'd been doing that for a long time. I nearly fell off my chair. His float up off the Goonie experience had stirred something deep in him, but he never spoke of that, preferring his own personal rituals. I couldn't think back on the rock concert or the rah-rah faith I'd witnessed at man camp without feeling at least a little spiritually checked out. But perhaps this was the belief I could get behind the kind steeped in private stillness far from the fervor of a crowd. That's how it ends. But uh, I thought he articulated very well how the world can perceive what church life or Christianity is like. And some of the questions I began to ask myself, and uh, you've got to hear me, I'm not here to criticize anybody else's ministry. So, you know, we don't want to start name calling or all that kind of buzz because there are all, <laughs> there are so many people that do that at the moment. But in our haste to get souls saved, have we compromised God's holiness to make Christianity more appealing to the world and more user friendly? See now, what I've noticed um, with churches around the world and even in this nation is that we have sophisticated media and on a variety of social media with flashy fonts, fancy presentations, amazing advertisements and relatable present presenters. I saw a service online during a Super Bowl, during the Super Bowl over in the States, and they had a half-time show with a group of performers singing a worldly song by an R&B singer named Usher. Uh, the pastor then came on and performed a Miley Cyrus song called Wrecking Ball, not sure if you know what the song Wrecking Ball this is the senior pastor of the church and then there was some skit that they performed where uh, the leadership team kicked a bible off the stage scoring a field goal to score a field goal uh, other churches have formulated their services their um, worship heavy 20 minutes word with little actual word to appeal to the short attention span of most people, according to them. Uh, some others have changed their churches to nightclubs with flashy lights, smoke machines. They have online, they have young, good looking people hosting like a late night talkback show. And uh, when, we, when we think about this man camp that we just read, there was 80 kegs of free beer and the camp director with a beer and a cigarette in, in hand. They're, they're, there's this molding to the world to try and make it look like we just like you guys. Other churches don't make it about the blood of Jesus. Don't you dare mention praying in tongues. Don't allow the gifts of the Holy Spirit to flow because it may offend or it might make some people not want to be saved, quote unquote. And so there's a lot of a series of questions that I, I, I thought about. What does it mean to authentically share the gospel with the lost authentically, with authenticity? Now, even if you do present the gospel with 100% authenticity, you will still, still people will say no. That's all there is to it. You're not going to be. Uh, uh, you're not going to have a hundred percent success rate. So people will still say no, and um, whether people receive Jesus or whether they do not receive Jesus, that is not the measure of your success of preaching the gospel into the into the world. The commission was 
go out into all the world and preach the gospel. It wasn't to go out in all the world and get people saved. Because then there is this line that we, we can sometimes keep failing at. But if you go out into all the world and preach the gospel, then you're successfully executing what Jesus asked us to do before he ascended into heaven. I remember listening to Pastor Jeff Vines. He used to be a, a minister here in North Shore, but he's moved back to the States. And he says, you know what? It doesn't matter how many times we pray for our family members who are lost, how many times we, we you know, our, our pillows are soaked with our tears and we intercede for our family time and time again. And it, it doesn't matter that, you know, even the, the gospel may be elaborated to them and, and maybe the laborers come in their way and they say all the right things and they, they, they bless them and they show them the ways to Christ and everything just becomes illuminated for them. People are still gonna, People can still say no because people are a morally free agent. They still have a choice. They still say, yes, I'd love to receive Jesus, but no, or they say, no, thanks, that's not for me. And so uh, the question that I, I want to pose to us during the series is how do we present the gospel with authenticity? How do we do this with genuinity or how do we do this being real? And um, there are people out there who are wanting not the world. There are people out there who are thinking to themselves, why would I change to your kingdom when it just looks like this one? And so um, we've got to be wary that if we, if, if people are attending churches that look like the world then people pastors leaders who do this are being led by the world and not being led by God they're following the trends they're finding they're following what is popular and so uh, please note though this is not an excuse for us to have sloppy presentations <laughs> God is excellent therefore what we do should also be excellent but we are not led by the world. We should be led by the source of excellence, which is God. We should be leaders of our field and setting the trends, not following them. Now it comes back to the question, how do we reconcile the world? Because John 3, verse 16 says, what does it say? For God so loved the that he gave his, that whosoever shall, shall not, but have, yes. How do we reconcile the world to God without losing or compromising God's holiness? How do we reconcile the world without losing the holiness of God or the holiness of God's kingdom? And I found a passage in the Bible that pretty much answers this. Isn't the word, isn't the word awesome? There's a very old saying that the Jews held fast to. And it talks about that now for the Jews, uh, Orthodox Jews who aren't Messianic, who don't believe in Jesus, they read the Torah or the Tanakh, the Torah and the Tanakh. So the Torah is the first five books of the Old Testament. The Tanakh is the, the prophets, so the law and the prophets. And this is what they say about the Torah. They said, the Torah has 70 faces. You turn it round and round for everything is in it. And I find that true with the Bible turn that Bible round and round, you look at it, you look at it, and you look at it again, everything that we need to win in this life is in His Word. Praise the Lord. And so uh, the answer to this question is found in Philippians chapter 2. We're we'll coming at verse 1. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 1. Philippians 2 and verse 1, it says, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded and having the same love, being of 
one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but lowliness of mind to let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out for not only his own interests, but also for the interests of others. So we're just going to break down this passage because we're going to read all the way through um, to verse 16. But I just want to take these two four, first uh, four verses that we just looked at. And one thing I want to highlight here is that the, Paul highlights the importance of gathering together. So this is talking about saints gathering together. If there is any consolation in Christ, if we've all been consoled by Christ, if you've received salvation through Jesus, if there is any comfort of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, then fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Now what's awesome about uh, being in the kingdom is that God is bringing us into the unity of the faith and unity of the knowledge of the Son of God. We are becoming of the same mind. Now, the one thing that he, this, this journalist here, winced at was the inconsistency in prayers for his dad. One person pray, uh, prayed that he would have a safe passage to heaven, that somehow or other that he would receive Jesus as his Lord and Savior. That's a good prayer. The other guy prayed for that he'd be fully restored and, and healthy and whole and live out the rest of his life here on the earth. Two different consistency, uh, two different prayers, and he winced at the inconsistency. But God is working on bringing us into one and the same mind, the same soul, same heart. We are all coming to think the same way about God. We're all coming to think the same way about Jesus. And we're all coming to think the same way about the will of God. Even the will of God here for our lives about sickness and health may vary. I'm here to tell you that God doesn't want you to be sick. That God has provided a way for you to be free from sickness and disease. You don't have to accept anything on your body. My Lord went to the cross with his back split open for you. So that we can be free from sicknesses and diseases, even mental health issues. God prepared and spilt his blood for them all. And when we come into that kind of same agreement and same line, then our prayers and our voice should sound the same and be consistent. Praise the Lord. So God is working on us. Verse 4, let each of you not only look out for his own interests, but also the interests of others. Amen. And so the church plays one of the most important parts of reconciling the world back to God. The ecclesia or the gathering of the saints are for the believers. They're for you guys. If you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the church or the gathering of the people is for you. It is not, I'm finding more and more times evidence in the Bible that it's not meant to be a, an outreach center. It is not a place for people to come and get saved. Oh, I'm trailing on some people's toes right now. <laughs> Now this uh, this all trample on me, even in some of our generals in, in the faith have said that the only reason the church exists is to save souls. I and and I agree in a sense, but the church or the gathering of the saints on a Sunday on on the Sabbath is for the saints, is the building of and is the edifying of the body of Christ. That is the one day we sanctify ourselves from the world. We come together. Don't get distracted by the bird this way and uh, Sundays is for you to be built up and edified and move more into the things of God to sanctify yourselves from the world Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday Friday, Saturday is for the world that's, it, that's you going out there into the world to do the work of the kingdom Whew. And so the ecclesia, the gathering of the saints, are for the believers. They build, edify. We build each other. We edify each other. There is a unity of the faith. We come into one accord. We praise together. We worship together. 
whether you are a brand new believer or you walked with God for 50 plus years, church is for you. God is building his glorious church. He's going to present her to himself a glorious church, not a glorious someone who attends church online separately. We need to gather together. Praise the Lord. And so we are here to sanctify ourselves from the world every week. We set ourselves to be holy within the presence of a holy God. First Peter says, be holy for I am holy. Be holy for I am holy. God still prizes his holiness. And what holiness does is that it invokes fear, a good, godly, holy fear. Praise the Lord. Now church is also a place of prayer. It's a place for honoring the word. It's a place for honoring his presence. And when people leave church here on a Sunday to head home, there should be an edification of that person, a building up of that person, a movement of that person to be more like Christ. That we are here, the church is here to inspire, to provoke, to rebuke, to teach, to correct through the word. Praise the Lord. So, one verses 1 to 4 talks about the church. Now let's move on to verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. We're in Philippians 2 still. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Now what we see here is Jesus steps down from glory. Jesus was God. He is God. But Jesus was in a different form. And he steps down from his glory and became like one of us. It says that he lessened himself like and became a humble servant. He humbled himself. And so Jesus stepped down from glory coming in the likeness of man. He forfeited his godliness glory and the word became flesh. And so not only did he come in our likeness, but he died in the likeness of the worst of us. Jesus, what I want to get from this here is that Jesus came to us. Jesus came to us. He didn't change heaven to make it look more appealing to the world and bring the world to heaven. But Jesus came to us. 2 Corinthians 5 verses 19, just write this down, I'll read it to you. It says, that is that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing any trespasses to them. I remember what that young student from Carmel, Maui said. He said, Christians are a bit judgy. But it says here that Jesus didn't impute trespasses to the world, so neither should we. And what was cool about this is that not only did Jesus come to us, but God was in Christ. God was in Christ to be with us. Jesus, and the awesome thing about Jesus is that Jesus loved hanging out with sinners. Jesus hung out with sinners. And this baffled the religious folks. See, when he came, uh, he walked past uh, a tax collector's box and he saw him sitting over there collecting taxes and he says, Matthew! Or Levi! I want you to follow me. His disciples were with him. Sorry, what? <laughs> do, you, do you not know what he does for a living? He's a tax collector. Not only was he, uh, did he call him to follow him, he went to his house, and this is what it says in the Word, that many tax collectors and sinners sat together with Jesus and his disciples. <laughs> he was having a party at Matthew's house, and he was sitting there with them. And some of the scribes and the Pharisees came to check it out. And they said amongst themselves, how is it that he sits and eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? See, tax collectors, they were their own brand of sin. 
they, they, didn't, they weren't just classified as just sinners. But they were tax collectors and sinners. Tax collectors were looked at as traitors. You were a traitor to your people. Their family would disown them. I would no longer call you my son. And so the scribe is saying, hey, he sits in drinks with tax collectors and sinners. He's there judging stuff going on. Jesus said to him, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not called the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. And what was quite cool about this is that Jesus was not afraid to use the word sin or sinners in the presence of the lost. He was not afraid to use the word repentance. Jesus went to the lost. See, I think sometimes we, we try and comfort or cuddle people from, uh, from the world and bring them into the kingdom, but there has to be an acknowledgement of sin in their lives. There has to be a, a repentance that, that takes place for them to come into the kingdom. Let's look at verse 9. We're still in Philippians 2. Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth, and those under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Now Jesus in the life of every person needs to be exalted. Through confession of his lordship in one's life, then you'll be saved. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, if you truly believe that and you confess the truth, then you're saved. But Jesus is Lord now. You've come into his kingdom now. He is Lord of your life, which means that he has the say. In fact, you have signed over the papers that you are no longer your own. Your body is no longer you. Your own is owned by Jesus. You are the kingdom's property. Your citizenship is written in blood red in heaven. Your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You are no longer your own. That's what it means to be under His Lordship. I wonder if they say that when they went to like, you know, get people saved and they go off to their little room and they talk to them about their salvation. This is what that means. I bet I guarantee a few of them are like, whoa, whoa, what? See, we forget about this when we talk to unbelievers. There has to be a bowing of the knee. You have to let the old life go. <laughs> the old man must pass away to get this new man. Church will then produce believers who are prepared to live this life of faith and not, and not be tricked into the kingdom. I think, I think many of the believers in the body of Christ today have been tricked into the kingdom. Verse 12. Still getting to the good part. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence now only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. And do all things without complaining and disputing. So be real. Be genuine. You know what real worship is? It's not here on a Sunday morning when you lift your hands. Real worship happens when you're by yourself. When you say no to things on the computer that you shouldn't be looking at and you fight it and you walk away, you're worshipping God. When someone pulls the fingers of you at you while you're, you're out there on the traffic and you pray and you bless them even though it really hurts your flesh, you're worshipping God. When you give an extra offering even though nobody knows about it, because you're believing God. Breakthrough. You're worshipping God. That's what real worship is. Here on a Sunday morning when we lift our hands to Jesus, this is just an outward expression of what we've been doing all our whole lives. That's what real worship is. And so Paul is saying here, don't just do this in my presence only, but also in my absence when I'm not watching you. 
So I'd like to encourage you that not, don't be holy just here on a Sunday, but also when I'm not around. When, when you're, you're at, at home, home when you're, you're at the supermarket. supermarket. <laughs> Praise, Praise the Lord. So, so work, work out your own salvation, salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. And do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless children without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Hold fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I may run in vain or laboured in vain. So shine your light in the world. People need to see light. People need to see something that opposes darkness. People need to see joy in times of frustration, in times of anxiety, in times of worry. This world is just gonna, is going to get worse. But there is a land of Goshen where the light comes out of it. You know, when, in the time of Egypt when things were just turning to crap and it, the pestilences and, and things were dark and there was places was being bombed, Goshen was a safe place because God reserves and set his people apart. And people need to see it and that what I believe is authentic Christianity. That God must be real and genuine in your own life. Not just a Sunday morning. So shine your light out in the world. Praise the Lord. Bring them to church. But the real salvation happens out there. We've got to go to people. Sometimes I think we kind of look at Rhema Family Church and go, man, our evangelistic kind of side of things is uh, uh, a little bit low here. And, you know, we don't organize stuff. It's not for the church to organize stuff. I find now that the church is to build the saints for the reconciling of the world back to God, which means that you guys who aren't fivefold reconcile out there and then bring them here to be built. You save them out there, you go to them just like Jesus made himself of no reputation. I'm going to talk about this tonight, going to pubs. <laughs> Make yourself of no reputation. Don't think you're too holy for some of these dark places with the intention of getting souls saved. You've got to stop being too holy for the world. Jesus got his hands dirty. We've got to get our hands dirty. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So I thought that article was, was, was quite profound. I read it and, I, and you know what? I think God, he drops stuff into my lap and says, I want you to check this out. And as I was going through, I was going, gee, this is how the world kind of perceives Christianity. And the more I look around and the more I actually take notice of what's happening in the body of Christ, I come to see that this rings true. Too many inconsistencies, too many performative stuff too much unauthentic believers because we're not genuine and we're not real with God but that people need to see real genuine Christianity people need to see authenticity in your life people need to see God in you that's all I have for you this morning 22 minutes early but that's okay that's enough for this morning Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father, Lord God, that you are good, your mercies endure forever. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you are, are working in us and through us. You're perfecting that which concerns us. You're bringing us into the unity of the faith and unity of the knowledge of the Son of God, where we all think the same way. We all have the mind of Christ. We all know what the will of God is for each one of us. And Father, I just thank you, I worship you, and I praise your glorious name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord.
worship you. We praise your name. We praise your name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank you. Your will be done. Your kingdom come in our lives. We thank you, Lord, that our radars are now switched on to those that are lost. Father God, we just show us the way, Lord, to show us where we go. In Jesus' name. And Father, I thank you for real connections here, Lord, this week. I thank you for genuine, real encounters with God in our, in our private times. Thank you, Lord. I thank you that your presence shows up in our bedrooms, shows up in our cars, Lord God. I thank you, Lord, that you are good and that your goodness goes out before us and overtakes us. I thank you. You reveal yourself in our families, in our homes. And Father God, I just thank you, Lord, for more of you, more of your power. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God bless you.